Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Matthew Gordon. My pronouns are he, him. I am the executive director of Climate Tech Action Network, and I really want to thank you all for coming out here today and being here to talk about sustainable batteries. This is a super exciting topic. Um, CTAM was formed um, three-ish years ago, four, four years ago, something, uh, late 2019, perfect timing. And um, we uh, started with the idea that there are a lot of people like you in the Bay Area who are thinking to themselves, boy, this is a really important problem and I would like to do something about it and not like, you know, figure out how to get more eyeballs on ads or something. And um, from the idea that there was a lot of talent and a lot of passion, um, I really wanted to take the opportunity to educate people about the critical issues facing our community of engineers and entrepreneurs and technologists and what we can do to move the trajectory of the Titanic just ever so slightly to try and avoid uh, human suffering. So I really appreciate you all being here to learn about um, one of the many aspects of the problems that we are trying to solve as society, as scientists, as entrepreneurs and engineers. Um, I also wanted to um, mention, in case you haven't noticed, if you're not on our mailing list, that uh, we've started a new Substack that I'm writing. It's called uh, The Slow Moving Apocalypse. Um, we all lived through the, the, the fast moving apocalypse uh, recently, but the slow moving apocalypse is still, still lumbering towards us. And so uh, if you don't get your share of um, technology and snark and ideas and um, inspiration and more snark tonight, uh, you can uh, join me uh, on Fridays when I send out uh, the slow moving apocalypse. Uh, we talked about uh, decarbonizing aviation uh, last week. Um, and uh, finally, I want to mention that um, if you like coming to these events, if you're excited about these events, uh, I would ask and implore each of you to talk to the large organizations or small organizations that you might be members of. We're looking for uh, sponsors for upcoming events. We are looking for uh, overall sponsorship. Um, this is a really great networking event. This is a very, very highly concentrated group of people who are very interested in very specific things. And um, if you look at um, the statistics from our Substack, it gets opened by like 90% of the people it gets mailed to because these people who are here tonight care about these topics and they want to hear about it. So if you are a company that is looking to foster um, a meeting of the minds and a discussion about important technological topics, this is a place to do it in the city of San Francisco, in the Bay Area, if you want to um, be part of that conversation. We'd love to have more companies come and help us uh, foster this conversation. Upcoming events next month, March 15th, is that right? Yes. Yeah, uh, you, you might have to tune in. No, the 16th. March 16th um, uh, is uh, methane, mm -hmm. uh, where I cut my teeth in methane mitigation. Uh, it's, uh, the event's gonna be called the, the 100X Threat. Um, and if you don't know why, then you should come. Um, so uh, methane is terrible. And we do have, Aaron here is gonna be on the panel next week talking about methane, um, about uh, Aaron and I worked together at Kairos Aerospace and plugged a lot of methane leaks during our time there. Um, and there's still a lot more. Um, and then further off in the future, um, not yet a date set, but we're hoping for April, we're gonna be putting on um, an event uh, with uh, the Berkeley Center for Law, Ethics, and the Environment about the 2035 California transition to electric vehicles and how to do that without leaving marginalized communities behind. Um, Madhur Balur here is gonna be on the panel and um, we are going to be talking about uh, with um, uh, nonprofit organizations and advocacy organizations and um, state legislators about uh, I don't want to name people yet uh, until we have it nailed down, but there's going to be a really, really cool, um, except for you all, maybe. Madura's also on our board, so he can't escape. Um, uh, about really cool topics about basically like, how do we transition to electric vehicles without absolutely ruining the lives of renters, 
um, marginalized communities, super commuters, uh, people who don't have necessarily access to the capital to buy an electric vehicle. Um, these are all really important questions as we um, tear towards 2035, what the technology is gonna look like at that point, and what the opportunities are gonna look like at that point, and what the state and, and uh, what the technology companies and what um, activists can do to help make sure that, that transition is one that does not fall disproportionately on marginalized people. Um, and that's also what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, batteries are in everything, and basically, if you think about, some of you may have read, how many people here read what I wrote about the five minute primer on sustainable batteries on Substack? A few people, all right, more of you need to read. Um, so basically, uh, if you ask uh, Saul Griffith, who um, keynoted our climate tech conference a couple years ago, how do you fix climate? The answer is you electrify everything and then you decarbonize electricity. So electrifying everything requires a lot of battery storage. And batteries are made from very expensive metals that come from places on Earth that have a um, very difficult time getting those metals out of the ground sometimes. So um, how many of you have been to um, a Z-TAN event before? This is really cool, there's so many new people here actually, it's really awesome. Uh, at the beginning of every CTAN event, I like to talk about um, units. My background is as a physicist, and uh, I love to talk about units. Um, absolute unit. So the unit here that we're gonna talk about for a second is uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. So somebody who is here for grid storage, can you tell me what a kilowatt hour is? Does anybody know what a unit of, uh, kilowatt hour uh, is a unit of? Not you. Energy. Energy, thank you. So basically kilowatt hour is how much uh, energy a kilowatt for an hour. Kilowatts of the energy of power, so that's energy per time. You multiply it by an hour, you get energy. So it's basically how much energy can your battery hold? How far can it go? How far can it take your car in this case? And kil uh, dollars per kilowatt hour is how expensive is it? to store a kilowatt hour of energy. And that basically depends on how expensive is it to make these batteries in this case. So you can see that since 2010, the cost per kilowatt hour of batteries has dropped by about uh, tenfold. That's amazing. You can also see that since 2018, it's been flattening. It means we're not making as much progress on making cheaper batteries. And that is why it is really important that we figure out how to make batteries more sustainable. I want to talk to you a little bit briefly about what a lithium-ion battery is. Um, my day job is at Toyota Research Institute working on um, manufacturing batteries. So this is a topic near and dear to my heart. I very intentionally pushed this topic as an event down the road until I absolutely could not find panels for anything else and decided to go the easy route. So um, we're talking about lithium-ion batteries here today because it was somewhat easier for me to put this panel together. Um, but. Um, that's why we're talking about methane next time, too. That was another easier one for me. Um, but uh, lithium-ion battery is uh, energy storage technology, and if you look at the thing on the, um, the uh, right-hand side here, uh, the, uh, the cathode uh, is made from um, lithium, cobalt, nickel, uh, and a lot in metals. And the thing on the, on the other side, uh, the anode is made from graphite, and you can see the little red lithium ions. They move back and forth and shuttle the charge back and forth. As you, put, as you charge it up, they migrate out of the uh, anode into the cathode and vice versa, right? Yeah. All right, I always get it mixed up. So um, I'm a terrible chemist is the problem. Um, and if you look at the cost of these things, 51% of it is lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese in that cathode. 24% of it is manufacturing, something I'm working on trying to reduce the cost of. And then the anode, uh, the electrolyte is extremely corrosive and terrible for you and has a lot of lithium in it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, other stuff, the housing, the, uh, the packaging. Um, lithium ion batteries also explode, so they have to make very um, heavy duty packages. That's another thing I'm, ho I'm hoping to work on is making that happen less often. Um, so batteries are expensive to produce. Uh, they're expensive to scrap, they have a limited lifetime, and we would like to figure out ways to make batteries that last longer and that we can reuse the parts of and that are less expensive to make. So we have had, um, I just wanted to introduce one more unit of measure here that's an interesting one. Um, 
which is uh, basically about how, why batteries are so big. And there's a lot of answers for that, but if you want to study the topic, a really interesting unit of measure is called energy density. Energy density is how much energy you can fit into that battery, the physical space of the battery. And on the vertical axis here, you have uh, watt hours per liter. So that's volumetric energy density. How big does the battery have to be? And on the uh, bottom here, watt hours per kilogram. You can see it's roughly linear. Um, they do scale with each other, but that's how heavy the battery has to be. And heavier batteries, of course, take up a lot more of the weight of your vehicle, of your airplane, of whatever it is, your watch. And um, so both of these are important units to, to bear in mind with as we look at scaling up battery technologies. Um, so with that in mind, um, I wanna mention that we had a slight change up in our plans tonight. Um, uh, our new energy, 1.ai, is not able to make it tonight. Uh, they are involved in making um, lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, sustainably. Uh, lithium iron phosphate is a chemistry that doesn't use as much cobalt, for instance, and therefore um, has uh, some very desirable properties from a sustainability standpoint. Um, on the other hand, uh, they couldn't be here. So um, what we have done is a little shuffle. Anas Madhur Balur, uh, who uh, is really extremely well educated on batteries to uh, step in as a panelist, and I am going to moderate. So apologize if you were here to hear 1.ai. Uh, you'll have to go find them somewhere else, I guess. Um, and with that, I wanted to take the opportunity to give each of our panelists a chance to talk a little bit about their company, what they're working on, and their area of expertise. And then um, we're gonna have uh, some questions that I'm gonna ask the panelists to address, and then we are going to have Q&A. So I wanna start with Wesley Jang. Um, did I, am I pronouncing your name right? Yep. That's right, I'm terrible with names. Okay and um, uh, from Posh Robotics. Um, we got Tom Hunt from Cobalt Metals. We got Madhur Balur from uh, Toyota Research Institute. Hi everyone, um, Wesley. Um, uh, maybe I'll just do a brief intro myself and then I'll talk a little bit more about the, the company that I'm uh, working on. Um, so I spent about five years um, uh, doing battery research at Stanford. I work with Pervy Trade. Uh, then spent about a year with uh, Steve Chu on uh, some lithium metal work um, back in 2015. Um, after that, I worked at Lucid briefly before I started my own company uh, in a completely different field. Uh, we built drone uh, for delivery applications. Um, uh, we sold a company last year um, and uh, decided to venture out again uh, to get back to my room because I saw a lot of exciting stuff going on in the batteries and UV space. Um, so I started Posh. Uh, basically, uh, Porsche um, is trying to make batteries more sustainable. Um, and the idea uh, came from uh, visiting some of the facilities that are doing battery cycling and reuse, and we saw them um, uh, kind of doing a lot of manual work of disassembling retiree batteries. And in particular, there was a um, company based in Oklahoma, they are processing uh, uh, some of the battery recall from one of the major auto OEMs and there was about 140,000 uh, battery packs there and it took them um, uh, a lot of time to disassemble just those battery packs and they built a million square feet warehouses to store those batteries and um, uh, at the time when we visited them um, uh, it, we, 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 we did a kind of bag of envelope calculation it would take them roughly uh, three years just to finish like disassembling all those uh, batteries from that particular recall. And, um, and after a few more visits, I realized there's a big problem like how all these batteries get built. I imagine um, 2035, the only vehicles that are building are EVs, and those batteries um, are, uh, coming back, uh, what, what should we do with them? And a lot of them are not really re um, reusable. I mean, most of the batteries are recyclable uh, in real life, but most of the EV batteries um, uh, retire before they are completely useless. It means that there's still a lot of juice inside. Um, you still need to figure out how, how to best disassemble them. Um, so we started on figuring out how, how to best disassemble u packs. Now we, we kind of um, also doing, um, figuring out the best way to manufacture battery packs so that they are uh, more sustainable in the sense that they can be effectively reused and easily recycled. Um, and, we have built like uh, we're in the process of building like an automation system 
to, to do that, like both disassembly and reassembly and manufacturing of battery packs in a way that they can be easily reused and recycled. Um, we, we are still a small team with about 6,000 square feet warehouse facility in Hayward. We closed the C round about $4 million mid last year. Um, and yeah, happy to share more about the details. And we're also working on, uh, looking for talents to join the team. So happy to chat with anyone who are uh, interested in this space. <laughs> Thanks, Wesley. Do you mind if I ask? Uh, oh, I have my own. Oh, okay. so you, do you mind if I ask? You worked with Steve Chu, the uh, Nobel Prize winning Steve Chu, or a different Steve Chu? Yeah, this is the one. <laughs> oh, okay. I, uh, I actually worked, um, uh, I published a paper with um, Tech Jim Ha, who was his postdoc, uh, but I was in biophysics. Oh, Back when Steve Chu did that, I have no idea. He, didn't, he was working on something else. No. So well, he, yeah. Um, he's still the professor of, uh, in, in the, bi I think it's a biophysics department, yeah. but somehow after, like, uh, his stint at uh, DOE, he got very interested in batteries and stuff. So he ended up like supervising some students uh, on uh, energy storage, um, carbon capture, um, air filtration. <laughs> yeah. He's pretty smart. We once uh, were planning um, an event uh, for biophysics, single molecule biophysics. And Steve Chu sent his regrets that he had been appointed to the Secretary of Energy and wouldn't be able to make it. And we were like, oh, bad excuse. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom with Cobalt Metals. And uh, Matt, you showed us this like really compelling battery cost curve, an exponential decline over the past decade. But 2021 is, um, is not showing up there. And that's, that's disappointing because 2021 is the first year that, that I know about where battery prices actually went up. And this year they're staying up. And that's, that's what we at Cobalt Metals hope to address is that 51% of the price, which might be more like 75% now, and I'm not exactly sure, it depends day to day, but the amount of the price of these batteries that is the minerals that go into making them. So Cobalt was founded to find the lithium, the cobalt, the nickel, the copper that we need to enable the energy transition. Um, we are a mineral exploration company. We start, we, um, in order to find minerals, um, we start at the continent scale. So for example, across all of Australia or all of Canada, we can take in satellite imagery and publicly available data and work with our geologists to locate regions that are prospective for minerals. Within those regions, now we start to need different kinds of techniques to target specifically the deposits that we're looking for. A billion dollar lithium deposit is something like only 100 meters by 100 meters by 100 meters in size. And we have to find that in a continent or then in a province. So we then use, uh, it, it used to be, back in the good old days, what you did is just walk around until you saw an unusual rock like this makes me feel at home that you have some interesting minerals. This one won't help you, it's just quartz. But um, you'd, you'd walk around until you found an interesting rock and then start digging from there and, and see what you've found. Well, basically all of the minerals that are out, that's called outcropping, all the minerals that are outcropping have been found all over the world. So we need to find minerals that are under the ground. Now there's still plenty of metal out there um, because we have found basically like, Uniformly in the Earth's crust, we can mine economically up to about two kilometers depth. And so there, there is plenty of metal out there. It's just that we have to find the metal that isn't outcropping. So what do we do? We have satellite imagery to find um, places that, that are prospective. And then within those regions, we use geophysical and geochemical techniques. So things like essentially exactly the same uh, metal detector that you might see at the beach. We have a giant one of those that we hang off of a helicopter, fly it around, and then um, use algorithms to reconstruct what, where the conductive bodies under the ground might be. Um, from that point, now we may have found a conductive body, but is it metal? Well, it's time to drill a hole. That's the only way that you're actually going to find out. Each hole costs one or two million dollars, so you better really uh, do a good job finding those holes. Here's another thing that Cobalt brings to the table. Traditionally, you just drill a hole every 400 meters, you go back to your bank and, and ask for another million dollars, right? You just drill a grid of holes. What we, what we do is make synthetic models of what the subsurface, what might be in the subsurface, and not just one model, but thousands of different models, right? So we use distributed computing in order to make that feasible. And then with those thousands of models, we, just, we figure out 
where you know we're drilling not just for success in finding metal but to reduce uncertainty of what's underground and so we'll reduce as much uncertainty as we can with the first hole as much as we can with the second hole and eventually either sterilize that ground decide there's no metal there or um, make a discovery so we have projects um, on three continents uh, in north america we have uh, projects in canada we have projects in australia we have a big project announcement in zambia we also have a project in greenland um, the sun never sets on cobalt, and um, we, we doubled in size last year. We're looking to double it again in size this year. We're hiring, um, so I'm excited to tell you more about the metals that, that go into battery production. Thanks, Tom. And I just want to mention, um, I always have appreciated um, the D&D reference. I slew a lot of cobalt when I was 12. Um, they're very nasty, low-level creatures. Uh, but uh, you know, once you get up to about level ten or twelve, you don't have to worry about them anymore. Yeah, it's uh, the company is named after the German gremlins that are this historical, and that's what cobalt is named after. Cobalts that uh, See, were underground together. <laughs> <little monsters. laughs> there you go. And uh, Maduro Blur. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> I've already learned things today. This is great. Um, so my name is Maduro Blur. Uh, it's super exciting to see so many people here on a Wednesday night to listen to us talk about a seemingly obscure topic that's critically important. Uh, it makes me really optimistic about the future because we need uh, as many people as we can get who have diverse backgrounds uh, in every sense of the word focus on climate solutions. So this is, this is awesome. Um, in terms of background for myself, uh, so I studied material science back in the day, um, worked on hydrogen production, batteries, solar cells, etc. Uh, and stepped into that space because I knew that I wanted to work on climate solutions like I imagine many of you either are, are doing already or want to. Um, and, and I think my first foray was experimental material science. Uh, what I've learned over the years is there are many, many really cool, impactful ways to help with climate mitigation. So what I did after grad school was to join the California Energy Commission, uh, where I spent some time uh, thinking about heat pumps primarily, so looking at residential decarbonization, uh, and that was a lot of fun uh, and educational. Uh, thinking about it from a policy and kind of consumer preference perspective. Uh, from there, uh, went to join the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, so environmental nonprofit. Um, I was in their DC office, and that was my first taste of nonprofit, you know, advocacy, think tank type work. Uh, was largely looking at systems analysis. Uh, so trying to just understand how policies on the state or the federal level uh, impacted emissions reductions, impacted customer bills, uh, and many other aspects. Uh, and that was a ton of fun as well. And from there, ended up joining the uh, Department of Energy uh, in DC as well, in their vehicle technologies office. Uh, DOE does a ton of really cool work, uh, and, and arguably even more so now that they're better funded. Um, and I was working on their systems analysis team, uh, looking at uh, EV charging requirements, understanding what type of uh, charging specs and amounts and in what locations would be needed to support uh, different levels of EV uh, build out, rolled out, right? Uh, also looking at total cost of ownership, life cycle emissions analyses, a bunch of really fun uh, quirky, uh, quantitative, wonky uh, topics that uh, was a lot of fun to spend time on. And for certain sure, sure. values of fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun is subjective, but universal. Uh, what is it, type one fun, type two fun? <laughs> Both. Uh, and so from, from DOE, uh, I decided I wanted to get a better understanding of how the private sector made decisions. So, uh, and I also wanted to get a better sense of how other parts of the world uh, think about decarbonization. So I ended up joining uh, Kia, the car company, uh, in their European headquarters. So I moved to Germany, uh, spent some time there focused on EV charging strategy and battery strategy, kind of straddling the technology and the business side, um, which was super educational. Uh, you know, thinking about uh, things like battery chemistries to uh, ISO standards for charging, uh, like ISO 15118 for plug and charge for the, I know there's some, yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was a lot of fun and, and, and uh, where I am now, where I came after that was to join the Toyota Research Institute. Uh, and what brought me there is it was an opportunity to try to actually roll up and fold up all those different pieces 
uh, and get a chance to work on decarbonization from all of those perspectives, to think about the policy, to think about a kind of investment, to think about technology, uh, consumer preferences, all kind of folded into one. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce Toyota. I think most of you are familiar, uh, biggest car company in the world. Um, Toyota Research Institute is a fascinating place, not too far from here. Um, and so they, we look a lot at interesting applications, uh, primarily in machine learning, uh, to try to resolve a variety of problems. Um, and really, uh, what our part of the organization does within the energy and materials division uh, is to look in part at how do you find uh, promising materials for tomorrow uh, faster. And these are materials like electrodes for batteries, catalysts for fuel cells. How do you understand the degradation of batteries? Kind of what makes batteries fail? How do you predict that earlier? And what can you do with that kind of information? How do you make them fail less often? Um, and uh, we also have incredible work happening on the manufacturing side, looking at machine learning to improve, for example, uh, manufacturing yield. Uh, which is super exciting as well. And the, the part that I sit in, the carbon neutral side, is again looking at the interdisciplinary perspective of decarb, uh, all those different aspects. Uh, we were really spearheading a lot of exciting work on systems analysis, uh, and uh, we're not necessarily, well, I guess we are doubling in size in the system side. So yeah, if you are interested. Uh, <laughs> Literally anything. Come challenge us, yeah. Thank, thank you, Andrew, thank you. And I also want to just very quickly, before we move on to questions, acknowledge the uh, I'm very excited by the presence of Sarah Mayer here tonight. Sarah has been working uh, with me at CTAN for three some odd years, and we have literally never met in person until tonight. So everybody, I want you to give a big hand to Sarah, because we would not be here tonight if Sarah was not on this all the time. So thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and Sarah also helped me not forget to turn on the video this time. Um, so let's dive in. I have a list of questions here that were written by Madura, so he might have a slight advantage. Um, but uh, we're gonna pretend, I, I, you know, I've, I've given all the qualifications that we work together and stuff, so um, it's not a competition anyway. Um, so, but these are really great questions, so thank you. Um, we've seen raw material prices, especially lithium prices, increase significantly over the last 18 months. I think um, the last time I looked, uh, Tom, tell me if this is right, that they had gone up 400% in like about a year, or what was it? Yeah, something like that. There, there are long-term contracts that aren't traded on that, so yeah. it's a little more stable than it appears, but yeah, a lot. You ask somebody in, in, in sort of this kind of technology field a, a straightforward question, and they always give you a, a qualified answer, which is great, because we're here to talk about the, the nuances. Um, and so um, let's, uh, let's ask for a question. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody, um, what, what are the causes of sort of the run-up in lithium and other metal prices? And um, what do you think we can do to improve it? Um, what, what are some of the strategies that the industry can take to actually um, bend that cost curve? Uh, Wesley? Yeah, um, I think the price of lithium company, I think is like increased by 10X from, I think, uh, a couple of years ago um, to, like, I think uh, the peak was November 2022. Um, it, it, it's come down a little bit, like 20, 10, 20 percent, but still extremely high. Uh, of course, um, the reason is every, everybody is rushing to building EV. Uh, almost every single automakers in the world have announced the decision to make only EV by 2035 or somewhere around there. So there's a huge pent up demand uh, for uh, materials to the point that uh, actually, other than Tesla, a lot of the automakers are losing money on making EV because the upstream material cost uh, has increased so much. Um, I don't think it's a problem of like reserve. We have a lot of lithium. It's a problem of throughput. We just don't have enough processing capacity to extract the lithium out. And for those of you who know how lithium get processed, it's basically put it under the sun, let, let the sun do the work and just wait. Uh, because that's how things have been done and it's the most cost-effective method. Um, there, are a lot of start uh, there are a few startups trying to innovate on improving the throughput, but I haven't seen like a scale-up process yet. So uh, I think it will take a while before the supply and demand kind of equilibrate. Um, but, but I think it's, it's going to come down um, um, uh, in the next couple of years. And do you think recycling is going to play a part in that? 
Yeah, so um, um, the, the, the biggest EV uh, kind of market and uh, manufacturing is happening in China. And last, I, I, I learned, I think last year, uh, recycling um, kind of consists of 20, like 20% 20 of raw material in all the battery manufacturing comes from recycling materials. Um, I think in other places of uh, the world, it's probably like still extremely low. Uh, in US, we are uh, catching up. Uh, we see all the announcement about big investment into Redwood, Sand Elements, and, which is awesome. Um, but I think it will take a while before we have enough retired EV batteries to recycle to, recycle, to, to, to uh, help alleviate the problem of raw material demand. I think in the next, I would say maybe five or maybe before 2030, the majority of the material we need to, um, to, to, to produce EV will still need to come from uh, raw material. Right, machine material. Tom, do you, do you agree with Wesley that the problem is not uh, supply but throughput? Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a lot of li lithium is not a rare material. What's rare is high concentrations of lithium, but even that's not that rare. Um, the hard part is the social license to operate to actually be able to extract that lithium. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a sad story from North Carolina. Maybe some of you have been following this, but there was a, a lithium mine from 1920, active from 1920 to 1980, and then abandoned because it wasn't profitable to extract lithium. Now, in 2015, Albemarle, one of the big mining companies, bought that resource. There's no risk in that resource. They understand exactly where it is. Um, they're expected to bring that online in 2027. So that's from an existing brownfield mine site, it takes 12 years just to get production going. Um, and we need to build more than 100 mines by 2050 in order to replace the 1.3 billion light duty vehicles with electric vehicles. So recycling will be very important, but it will be important in, in quantity out in time as we um, really, uh, right, we need, we need a lot of a lot of batteries in cars before those cars then re reach end of life and need to be recycled. So um, it, the time delay, the, the speed of EV adoption versus the speed of the ability to construct new mines and extract new resources are, are mismatched. So I expect this supply demand to be really, really tight for a long time. Um, and Madhur, um, I'm split here because I want you to answer this question, but I'm also curious what you think about um, what can be done um, both in terms of bending the cost curve, but doing it in a sustainable way, um, making the, 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 uh, the whole chain more sustainable. Um, you know, there's circularity, there's improvements in um, how we mine, but do you think that those two things are intention, sustainability and, and sort of increased supply, or do you think that there's things we can do that, uh, that, that help us attack both? Yeah, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> um, I, I think, first of all, I think our observations are similar to what's been what's been said before. I think the problem, and, and it's kind of weird to call this a problem, but that uh, the batteries we have are too good, right? They last too long. So we're, they're not reaching end of life fast enough for that to help with the supply problem in the coming years, right? Um, and, and it's a good problem to have overall, right? And so given that, what, what do we see as the pathway forward in, in the near term? It's been said that a lot of these, it, if only they lasted like 300 miles and you burned them and then you had to get them out of the ground again and just put them, yeah, and put them right back in, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we, I think um, it, it, we, we're optimistic about the kind of medium to longer term here, right? The looking like, I don't know, seven, say eight years. There's a fair amount of optimism there that either you know, new mines and recycling is gonna really help uh, bridge this gap. Uh, we think a lot about what happens in the meantime. Right? We don't really have the time to wait uh, to, to, to roll out solutions to start decarbonizing. Um, and we think a lot about, you know, given constrained supplies of critical materials like lithium, uh, what is the best way to deploy that constrained supply to maximize carbon reductions cost effectively? Yeah, actually, um, I mean, uh, there's an there's a idea that's been floating around about how to uh, optimize is to build smaller car, like car with smaller batteries. I know it's probably not the most popular idea in the US to have a smaller car, <laughs> probably more uh, popular in the UK, uh, like in Europe. But uh, I think this is one way, like if limited supply of batteries, you need that this number of cars uh, to be on the road, 
the, the, the solution is to be a smaller car, so each car needs like, a smaller battery pack. Well, the flip side of that is extremely fast charge, which I think you worked on, right? Because if you, you won't have range anxiety if you can charge in just a few minutes. And there are very challenging technical reasons why that's difficult to do. The, well, the current generation of batteries, of course, fast charging destroys them much more quickly. Uh, cause lithium dendrites, uh, can damage batteries. There are all sorts of problems that come from fast charging. So that's one of the tensions is people want to uh, charge faster, but it reduces the cycle lifetime. time. I, I, I love this. This, this is, I, I think that's, both of those are spot on, right? So one way to do it is to just roll out a bunch of BEVs that battery, battery electric vehicles, full electric vehicles that have shorter range. We've seen this do really well in China, right? Like one of the best selling EVs is like the Wuling Mini, which has it's like a 70 kilometer, I think, or 70 mile range, uh, but also costs way less. So when you think about the kind of the equity side of, of electrification, if you can have a, an EV that meets, you know, kind of urban driving needs for like $5,000, there could be appetite for that, maybe even here, maybe. Uh, Do you think this is the March 1st announcement that Elon has been <laughs> floating around? <laughs> there's a, the, there's the Model a 2, the anti-cyber truck. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, even there was talk, I think, uh, in the news uh, about Volkswagen uh, having an ID2, uh, which is meant to be a small EV, but it's not going to be 5,000. I think the ballpark estimates are around 20,000 20, pounds or so. Um, so, I don't know. 25 ish, 20, 28,000 maybe dollars. But, but yeah, so I think there, there's a possibility for, for, um, for smaller battery sizes. Uh, one aspect of that is certainly the charging side. So, uh, if you, you know, like you said, if you can't go far, it would be helpful to charge quickly. Some of the best charging we see on the market right now, it allows you to get uh, a couple hundred miles back in about 15 minutes. Right, so we've seen Hyundai, Kia, Genesis, Porsche, they have cars on the road that can give you a couple hundred miles in 15 minutes. It's pretty good. It's not gas fast, right, for fueling, but it's pretty good. Um, but then we also think about, is the consumer going to accept that? Even if you can provide uh, fast charging without degrading the battery for a short range vehicle. And in the US, I don't know. I think that's, there's reason for skepticism. And maybe a bridge solution is Another way to have a small battery, which is a plug-in hybrid, but then the you know there's a, a fair amount of skepticism about if you have a plug-in hybrid, are people going to charge? Are people going to actually use that battery? When you have a large enough battery in your plug-in hybrid, and as we invest in EV charging infrastructure, there's reason for optimism that they might. Um, I want to um, move on to a second question here. Um, uh, Wesley and Tom, and then I'm going to move on to you with a slight modification. I'm interested in hearing, um, so the, uh, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was uh, named as such in order to um, hide the fact that it's actually the largest piece of climate uh, legislation, uh, I think, ever in the U.S., the most impactful part, um, but Americans prefer to hear about inflation reduction, and it has, it has uh, provisions for that as well. But the IRA is sweeping. It has a huge number, like a dizzying number of provisions for all sorts of different parts of the climate sector. People are absolutely going gaga about it. And uh, I just wanted to hear from both of you guys what you think um, the impact of the IRA is going to be on your, uh, on your business models. Well, I think it'll have a huge impact on battery manufacturing in the U.S., on actually sourcing minerals. Um, we need to go to places that we can actually build mines, and that is rare in the U.S. There are, there are a few places in the U.S. That, that we can definitely permit and build mines, but not many. Um, but uh, we definitely feel the, the push for friend shoring, I think is what it's called, and so um, friendly mine, mining jurisdictions like Australia and Canada are, are some of the top targets, for sure. Do you think um, the IRA is going to give a competitive boost to um, companies that are trying to do, um, say, lithium extraction from brine? I think that the fact that the lithium price is four to ten times more than it was before has much more impact than That's than, right. Uh, That's right. What's it? Yeah, I think um, uh, just case in point, I've been writing grants for the past uh, 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 two months. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, it It is a... a a uh, massive uh, uh, deal, and um, I think it's like what 350 or 60 billion dollar over the next 10 years 
Um, the, the good thing about IIA is that it's not a one-off, right? So it's a 10 years program, and you know that for the next 10 years, there will be uh, a significant amount of government money going to this space. So you get an assurance that, okay, if I put my resources, even like invest, uh, invest my own time and resources and money into this, that there's a big opportunities uh, in the next 10 years. And then the, the second thing is that um, um, a lot of these are not like, um, um, you have to invent new science, all right? A lot of the battery stuff, uh, the, the, the science has been worked out. Uh, we just need to bring the manufacturing, uh, bring um, a lot of the know-how back to the United States and create jobs. And I think that's what IIA is targeting. Uh, I think it's not about creating like another uh, batteries that has 10x the energy density of the current um, uh, uh, lithium ion batteries. Maybe it's part of a little bit of money is, but I think the majority is how to figure out best way to manufacture batteries uh, economically uh, here and uh, get the ecosystem going. And I think, yeah, we is is definitely um, a, a, a very um, uh, beneficial uh, legislation that that can help um, kickstart the. Um, and um, sort of melding this with our third question for you, um, uh, one of the concerns with batteries, one of the sustainability concerns, is if you look at um, sort of uh, lifetime emissions um, from the process um, that, uh, uh, well, let's see, I'm going to read your question because it's well phrased. Uh, the emissions from producing batteries has garnered a lot of attention, and there have been reports claiming that the embedded emissions, that was the phrase I was looking for, thank you, uh, from vehicle emissions are roughly 2x that of an internal combustion engine vehicle. And so I'm curious um, both um, uh, what sort of you think is on the bleeding edge of sustainability to reduce uh, carbon emissions from battery production, as well as um, what, whether you think the IRA is going to help improve the carbon emissions from batteries, or whether there's, a, if there's anything in the IRA that targets that in particular. Awesome, yeah. This may be putting you on the spot to like <laughs> recite <laughs> chapter and verse from the IRA, and so like, I don't think, I, I almost expect you to be able to, but if you can, it's perfectly understandable. Chapter two scene. Yeah. Um, these questions were written for the actual battery experts. Uh, so I would say, um, yeah, so the embedded emissions are bigger for a battery electric vehicle than they are for an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, the percent difference is big, but I think what's important to realize is that the emission savings on operation is so big that your carbon payback period is pretty short oftentimes. How short do you think that is for uh, like a typical driver? Depending on a variety of factors, right? The ballpark it, you know, a couple years. A couple years, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, 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 you know, obviously depends on your grid mix and how big your battery is, and, and many other factors, but a couple of years. Um, and and I, I think that there are uh, a variety of, and also when you look at the embedded emissions, um, certainly a lot of that depends on the power source uh, where your battery is made. So if you have a lot of uh, electric processes for making your batteries, then the emissions from the power generation that go into making that battery in that location makes a huge difference. Yeah. So we, we've done some work showing that even in the US, there's like an 8x difference in emissions intensity for power generation in certain in different parts. Pacific Northwest, super clean, Midwest, less so. Um, and I think a short answer of can IRA help provisions to Friendshore may help a little bit. Um, there are regions that we have better kind of free trade agreements with, or if we domestically do it, there are regions where we can have better emissions for that production compared yep. to elsewhere. And certainly the IRA is gonna improve the availability of, of uh, renewables and improve the, the electricity, the quality of electricity that you're using to charge the vehicle as well, which would reduce the, um, uh, the sort of the, what was it, what did you call it? The, um, uh, the amount of time that it takes the, the, yeah, like the carbon, carbon payback, payback period. Um, and in the manufacturing process, um, I don't know end-to-end -end life cycle emissions for the batteries, but in the manufacturing process, by far the largest energy consumption comes from electro drying. So you uh, make a slurry with uh, the active materials, you, uh, you, you coat it onto the electrode, and then you have to put it through really big dryers. So actually a lot of potential, um, there's some papers on this, on reducing energy consumption from the dryers uh, using ML. Uh, and that's something I would like to see uh, more work be done on. Um, but uh, certainly improving the renewable mix 
um, makes that uh, a non-issue from a carbon intensity perspective. So uh, I think the IRA probably targets that. Um, again, electrify everything and then make electricity low carbon. Um, yeah, I think embodied emissions is the wrong metric. It should just be emissions per mile driven. And so then your the, the real comparison really is um, your gasoline, like even different types of gasoline have slightly different emission profiles, but an internal combustion car has something like 10% of the emissions are embodied emissions from building the car, 90% are tailpipe emissions. In the EV, you're gonna have more embodied emissions, and then your grid mix is really what that governs the overall lifetime emissions of your EV. And so that's the thing that we should really pay attention to is what those uh, the, the carbon intensity of your grid looks like as you're deploying EVs. In if, some places, it's better to, to deploy hybrids because the grid is so dirty. If, if we start getting into a debate about um, embedded emissions, it's gonna fight break out in here. I'm gonna rebomb the stage Ooh, probably. And, but, <laughs> Another thing is the recycle, like you're not counting end life, right? So those embodied emissions stay in the battery and then you can disassemble the battery and redeploy it in a power plant and it, it still has value at the end or recycle the metal. Yeah, the good thing about battery is that it, it is almost uh, infinitely recyclable. Um, I mean, of course you're putting energy, but um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the contents are metals and metals uh, you, can, you can extract about and then reuse it again. Uh, you do have to overcome, and what I wrote about in our primer, uh, the, the the entropy of mixing. Entropy of mixing is a problem. Energy. You, yeah, it's exactly. Like energy. <laughs> Every time you mix two th unlike things together and you get a mishmash, extracting them back apart requires a lot of energy. Um, so um, we've seen a steady march to reduce cobalt use in EV batteries, uh, down from an industry average 33% in cathode, down to about 10, the many OEMs opting for uh, zero cobalt options. And um, one of the reasons that we're talking about this is that um, most of the cobalt that's used, uh, it comes from uh, Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo. And uh, there's a very old joke that says the more modifiers that you put on the how democratic your country is, the less democratic it is. Um, and so uh, the DRC is a problematic place to be doing resource extraction from. Um, on pretty much all operations where we do resource extractions from um, less industrialized countries and then ship them to more industrialized countries create um, externalities on those populations, which is one of the reasons that we want to talk about sustainable batteries, because one of the most important things about the climate transition is that we not simply use it as a way to dump the, um, those externalities onto uh, less powerful people. It's one of the reasons we're talking about this today. It's one of the reasons we're going to talk about equity in the transition. But um, I'm interested in hearing, um, uh, is there any way that the cobalt supply can be increased sustainably, affordably, and ethically? Or do we need to basically start um, moving away from cobalt if we're going to actually uh, attack this problem? Um, I think um, we, we are uh, already moving away from cobalt. It doesn't mean that the demand for cobalt will decrease. I think it's just because the overall demand of EV has increased and uh, companies like Tesla and uh, almost a lot of automakers are looking to building LFP batteries uh, just because of the cost and um, um, the way uh, LFP is made, like you, you, you can make it uh, less, um, more sustainably. Uh, cobalt is still very important in the sense that if you're looking for like a um, high energy density batteries, you can't uh, go without like all the ternary structure like NCA, NC. Uh, so my, my prediction is that we will be seeing a lot of uh, EV with LFP um, um, and um, we will uh, we'll still see a lot of um, uh, cobalt demand but not like uh, linearly as much as like how the EV increase is going to be so yeah, you, you probably heard of like Ford is building like new factories for LFP, Tesla, according to Elon, they are going to move uh, two thirds of the vehicles to LFP. Um, and I think, I think just like inevitable, um, yeah. yeah. I'd say the, the societal cost of small scale mining is really tragic, and, but we can source these metals uh, sustainably and, and ethically. So the deposits that we're looking for are so deep underground, you can't get to them without giant trucks that even humans aren't necessarily driving. So um, 
you know, it, it's very sad that there are jurisdictions that are extracting metals from uh, from untrained people near the surface. But but if if we want to actually 10x the amount of metal supply, we have to dig deep for that. And I fully agree with the LFP trend for uh, electric vehicles. But I'd like to note that cobalt does make the best batteries. If you pull out your phone or your laptop, those are lithium cobalt oxide. Not even any nickel in there to dilute that cobalt because they are the most energy dense batteries you can possibly buy. So there's going to be continued demand for cobalt, and um, we will we'll find ways to source it. Mindra, can you um, educate us a little bit about um, some of the differences between um, LCO and LFP batteries, and why um, why why that transition is going on, and what the trade offs are? Uh, sure, I can I can start. <clears throat> um, the, so the the reason behind the shift toward LFP is, is numerous, but primarily because uh, they're cheaper uh, per kilowatt hour, so per unit energy, like we talked about earlier. Um, and, and we like the fact that there's, we being broadly in society, most of my comments are just as a climate tech enthusiast hat. Um, so societally we're moving toward there because there's no nickel, there's no cobalt, uh, it's, it's abundant, it's, it's cheap, um, which is good, but the energy density is low, right? So. Uh, what that means is that all things, all other things held equal, if you were to have a NMC, a nickel manganese cobalt battery, uh, which most auto companies have been, uh, automakers have been using, uh, compared to a lithium iron phosphate battery, uh, your range of your car may be 30 to 40 percent lower. All other things held the same. So that's really what's held it back in many places, but there's been a lot of great innovation on like pack engineering which has allowed the actual real world kind of uh, range in a given pack size to be a lot closer to that of NMC. And that's a big part of why you're seeing it boom and why you're seeing companies that have quite long range vehicles still use it for their short range options. Um, we have about 10 minutes officially left on the event, but I always uh, love to, uh, we always go over a little bit and I love to, um, uh, have as much time as we can for questions. And so I thought I would uh, pivot us towards a Q and A right now. Um, this is a pretty small room. Uh, did we get a, did we get a, a handheld mic? No? All right, it's a pretty small room. So if you want to stand up and shout, um, I can call on people or I can, uh, you can come up and ask a question if you prefer to talk uh, more quietly. So do we have any, uh, any questions at this point? Question. James, what's your question? Um, how would you uh, predict the uh, economic viability of recycling LFP batteries uh, in the future as compared to, say, cobalt-containing uh, batteries? Yeah, um, one of the uh, criticisms of LFP is that uh, the recycle value uh, is not as high. But I think first and foremost, I, I think uh, we should view batteries uh, focusing on uh, the first life first, and then um, uh, what Porsche is working on uh, is actually figuring out how to maximize the uh, uh, lifetime value of these batteries. So we do a lot of like disassembly, reusing, and second life applications. And uh, LFP is actually very good for second life applications, primarily because it's a safer chemistry. Uh, if you compare LFP to uh, NCA, or you can just Google YouTube like uh, nail penetration of uh, uh, NMC or NCA versus LFP, you will see a lot of videos. Um, and uh, it's a, I, I, can, I can talk for an hour about why the chemistry is different, but basically uh, for a lot of the cobalt and nickel based chemistry, it, 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 um, it's a little bit more dangerous because when you uh, over discharge, you release uh, oxygen. And um, if the electrolyte come into contact with um, uh, moisture, it produces hydrogen. So when you short circuit something, it produces heat. So when heat, oxygen, and hydrogen, uh, you, you get um, uh, firework. Uh, for LFP, uh, phosphorus is actually an inherently uh, fire suppressant. So um, when you short circuit LFP cells, you can still, still see smoke, but it doesn't burst into fires. So what I'm trying to say is that LFP is inherently safer than uh, NC and, uh, NCA, which means that uh, when we use those batteries, uh, it's inherently safer. And that's why a lot of the uh, non-EV application these days, like storage, solar storage, um, uh, power backup, 
they use uh, LFP cells. Um, and we have seen like a lot of um, um, uh, use case for second life LFP cells um, um, in, in, in other countries like Japan and um, um, China. So to touch your point, the intrinsic material value of LFP is not as high as NCA and AMC and, 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 and some other chemistry, but um, the second life use value is pretty, is actually quite high. Okay, thanks. Uh, questions? Uh, in the back. Question. So the energy density is clearly the thing for mobile applications, um, but the built environment is a huge source of emissions and in desperate need of energy storage um, to kind of control when, for example, solar energy is charged uh, or is discharged. We're seeing you know, significant policy change in California with their uh, emergency system. Uh, have a, a new net billing system for solar owners. So the question, punchline, is um, what do you see on the horizon for stationary applications where the energy density element uh, that we're focused on here so far in the conversation isn't really um, necessarily the, the pivot point? Uh, you should have been here um, for our very first panel on uh, batteries, on energy storage. And I will um, start by answering that there are a number of new technologies that people are working on for energy storage that are not battery based. Um, so we had uh, Antora Energy here, uh, which is making um, uh, thermal energy storage by um, just heating up blocks of graphite. Um, and uh, we were gonna have Energy Vault here. Um, uh, I was very interested to have Energy Vault here because I think a lot of people think that it's um, not viable, let's say, um, uh, to um, produce concrete, which uh, is very carbon intensive and lift those blocks up to do gravitational energy storage. I was interested in hearing what they had to say. It turns out they were getting sued at around the same time. I don't know if that's what caused them to pull out. But, um, uh, and then, um, of course we had, um, uh, we wanted to have electric fish here. Instead, uh, they, are, they were working on um, uh, putting uh, localized energy storage into uh, for chargers, um, and uh, who's the third uh, the third company? Form, form, form energy, uh, and so that's 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 the sort of the more direct answer to your question, which is that people are looking at um, much heavier chemistries like um, iron oxide that um, are basically useless for mobile um, applications. And then uh, the, the, the question that sort of comes about when you talk about these applications, and I'm gonna let our panelists address this also, is are we gonna be looking at a future where Second Life EV batteries are essentially so, um, so uh, uh, available that there's really n nothing that's gonna be cost competitive with just basically using old batteries from cars? Or um, are we gonna find that um, those batteries can be rehabilitated, put back into cars. They can be circularized. They can be other things that are going to make it pop. That, are, that is going to leave sort of that future wide open. And I think nobody has the real answer, but I'm interested to hear what our panelists have to say about the whole topic of um, stationary energy storage. I think, from a residential perspective, I'm really excited for vehicle to grid, right? Because if you're putting fifty thousand dollars into your new EV. This is a big second value stream that you get out of it. And if you have sufficient cycle life on your vehicle and you can now run your home at night, I mean, that's that's fantastic. So that's even before a second life, that's your first life battery doing that. Um, I think that for the like repurposed second life EV batteries will be important for that kind of lithium ion four to eight hour energy storage, but you need other energy storage solutions beyond eight hours for overnight and, and seasonal storage. And really, nobody has cracked seasonal storage at all yet. So that's that's the elephant in the room. Yeah, maybe palm hydro uh, for for longer duration. But I, I think um, um, maybe because today we are talking about the the, the price increase of uh, lithium ion and, and, and felt like there's not enough batteries. But I, I still think that lithium ion battery is a very strong um, candidate for stationary storage. Um, and in the foreseeable future, um, uh, we will be using uh, lithium-ion batteries, whether it's LFP or, or, or uh, some of the um, 
ternary structure, um, uh, lithium ion batteries uh, for energy storage. And uh, the demand is so high that, um, uh, again, one of the biggest producer of uh, um, lithium ion battery for stationary storage is Tesla, and they, they order uh, all the way to, uh, towards the end of, like, they are, they are booked until end of 2024. So um, there's just like a lot of demand for this, and with net metering, with for the IIA, I think there will be even more demand for um, um, battery storage. Um, and the good thing is that the, the chemistry is already very mature. Um, and in stationary storage, one of the factors that um, you have to look at is bankability. Meaning like, if you're a developer, you are putting out like stationary storage. The important thing is that whether the bank is going to give you money to build that, that system and lend you money uh, to finance the project for, for, for 20 or 25 years, or maybe 10, 20 years. Um, so I think in the, in the foreseeable future, I, I, I still think that uh, lithium battery is still going to be the, um, the main player in stationary storage and just need to figure out what's the best way to get as much lithium ion battery um, uh, out there for, for, for these uh, applications. Yeah, I'm optimistic on lithium ion for short duration, like has been said before. I, I think that I'm also optimistic on vehicle to grid. I've gone up and down on that over the years. I think now I'm very much up on it, and I think I'll stay there probably, but who knows. Um, we, we already see a bunch of vehicles on the road today that can push power back out of the car. So maybe not full vehicle to grid capability yet, but they can do vehicle to load, they can do vehicle to home, and it's really a fine line between that and grid. So, you know, Ford F-150 Lightning, uh, Hyundai and Kia, uh, the Toyota BZ4X in Japan, uh, variety of things, right? So I'm optimistic. Long durations, uh, yeah, uh, much harder, unsolved. Could be hydrogen, could be flow batteries, could be a giant hot carbon block like we've heard about. Uh, but, but even for grid storage, other alternative chemistries like sodium are, are interesting. Uh, there's companies here in the Bay looking at sodium batteries, uh, Prussian Blue Frameworks, Natron, um, and yeah. Camel's making a big uh, push into uh, sodium. Yeah, biggest battery manufacturer in the world. Uh, yeah, announced they're looking at sodium. Yeah. Um, I had something very witty to say, but I forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah. Are there any chemistries besides lithium ion that you think will impact um, portable energy storage in the next 30 years? Um, the most near-term thing that people are looking at is um, anodeless or uh, lithium anode. Um, so uh, some people, the, if you ever hear somebody use the term solid-state battery, you have to ask them to uh, say what they actually mean because that term has been used to describe like six different things. Um, so some people call those solid-state batteries, um, uh, and um, that is uh, QuantumScape in San Jose is working on that. Uh, is, uh, Novix is also working on that. Maybe there's, there's lots of companies working on um, solid uh, uh, on lithium anode, and those are I think going to have something like two to three x the capacity if they can be made to not um, burst into flames. Um, and there's a lot of like technical problems. Um, it takes a really long time to bring new battery chemistries online um, because. Uh, lithium ion is so extremely well tested. Uh, I heard a really great talk on this from um, somebody who was at Ford, um, and they showed a chart of all the safety tests and all the standardized safety tests that all the different organizations have done and how the different battery manufacturers have um, put uh, you know, the nail penetration test, the pinch tests, all that for lithium ion batteries, different chemistries, and then these for the next slide is safety testing for solid, um, for, for, uh, for lithium anode batteries, and it's just basically a big goose egg. None of the standardized testing for safety has been done on most of that stuff uh, for most of the manufacturers now, and so it's very difficult to know uh, what that evolution is gonna look like. Um, so that's my answer. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure about in 30 years, but at least in the next five, 10 years, I think you can't escape lithium. Like whether it's lithium metal or lithium ion, it, it, it uh, will be lithium based. and you have to recognize that um, like lithium ion batteries work um, because of miracles, in the sense that <laughs> it so happens that the graphite can intercalate lithium ion, it has this thing called SEI, then this thing called cathode that can um, um, uh, kind of uh, lithium in and out and um, thousands of times without damaging the, 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 
the material. And like there are a lot of miracles that happen, uh, I mean like uh, in terms of physics and chemistry that uh, allow lithium to work. And to find another chemistry that have all these uh, miracles in one chemistry is extremely hard. And um, um, especially for mobile application, like you're talking about high energy density, um, and, and looking at the periodic table, lithium is the lightest metal, so um, you, you can't beat it. Would you say that you think the lithium on high battery is good enough? <laughs> Raise your hand if you got that joke. Uh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Nobel Prize for lithium ion batteries. John Good enough. Well, uh, John Good enough did get a Nobel Prize. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't take the dad out of the <laughs> I guess the only thing not mentioned there is, is that it would be very exciting to have a, a, an air, a lithium or other metal air battery because then your the oxygen comes in for free from the air just like it does for gasoline. So if there's something that you could oxidize reversibly, that's the only way you could be uh, lithium, which is the lightest and most electric. Uh, yes. Um, I'm just wondering because the comment uh, Ford just announced they're pausing production because of battery issues. Of the F-150 Lightning? Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I heard the F-150 Lightning um, referred to as, um, uh, based on the price and the price per kilowatt hour, and the, and the kilowatt hours and the number of kilowatts, referred to as a battery that happens to have a truck attached um, for the price of the truck uh, is basically the price of the battery. Yeah, um, to answer the questions, um, so Ford is currently working with SK on um, for their current, like, um, F50 uh, or 150 lining, and that is based on uh, I think it's NCA or AMC chemistry. Uh, the up and coming factory they are building, um, which is with CATL, will be LFP based. They so, just announced that uh, yeah. this week or last week in Michigan, three point six billion dollar. Uh, yeah. 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 um, but I do have another question, which is, um, do you? Uh, I know you talked about the trade off between using second life batteries versus recycling. Uh, are any of you focused on using the second life batteries uh, currently, or are you more focused on recycling? I don't think anybody here is in the battery, um, is in the end user uh, uh, category except possibly Toyota, and uh, we're uh, not in second life. Uh, Toyota is really looking at first lines of batteries, I would say. Yeah, there are folks, uh, I mean, we, yeah, so we have like uh, official recycling partnerships. We have demos around Second Life. So I, I would say we are looking at it. Uh, we have teams that are thinking about kind of, yeah, future business cases there. Um, I think many automakers have done demonstrations and that's really been as big as it's gotten. So small scale using for other companies looking at like old Nissan Leaf packs because those are the only ones that have been around long enough, or one of the only ones, uh, right? So. I think it's been very small scale, um, but yeah, certainly being looked at. Yeah, I think um, the second life market right now is still kind of like wild, wild west. Uh, you, what you see on the news will be like demonstration by some automakers, but um, in reality, there are a lot of uh, second life battery applications out there. Like I know a company based in uh, LA, I think they have deployed like uh, hundreds, of meg hundreds of megawatt hour of uh, second life EV batteries for uh, low speed vehicles like forklift. Um, um, they are not in the news, but they are making pretty good money. <laughs> I'd rather make money than be in the news. Yeah. So you guys talked about some interesting like um, ways of optimizing how batteries are getting into cars in a way that could optimize essentially the um, carbon impact. How much of that actually happens in practice versus kind of optimization of the markets that they're putting those batteries into? Uh, that's a super interesting question because we should be electrifying. If we're, uh, yeah, okay. somebody who heard it better can you repeat it maybe. Uh, the question is, how are you optimizing the carbon? In, if you have a limited number of batteries, how are you optimizing the carbon impact of deploying those batteries? And is and is that actually happening? And is it to, to the yeah, I mean, what I would say is that if we were doing things logically, we would electrify fleet vehicles and heavy duty vehicles first because they have the most miles driven per year. 
And so instead of having a battery that's mostly sitting in your driveway and occasionally getting driven, you'd have one that's driven 10 hours a day, every day. Um, the world's not quite logical, and so a lot of batteries are being put into, in, into people's driveways uh, today. I would also say on that topic that if we were being logical, as was discussed earlier, we would be um, making smaller vehicles instead of rolling out um, uh, uh, electric SUVs and pickup trucks first. But we are constrained. Uh, I like to say that unless we're going to um, sort of ditch global capitalism in the next 25 years, we're pretty much constrained by it and we have to work within it. And the U.S. is a really big market and Americans like buying big cars and there's not a lot you can do even regulatorily without getting thrown out of office to change that. And so car companies are making cars that people want to buy and theirs are not really the best cars to reduce carbon emissions. Um, but it does push the industry forward in the direction that we want to go. And like I said, turn the Titanic. Just kind of do it a little bit at a time. Yeah, I think I mean, in general, industry moves when there's price signals and, and there's a lot of talk about carbon prices and how that can help kind of increase the skids and moving toward this so that it's not purely a carbon optimization motivation for strategy, but there's actually a, it's a cost motivation that is kind of upstream motivated by carbon, right? Um, it gets tricky. Uh, carbon prices are obviously uh, challenging, uh, both and especially politically. Um, there's interest in, in having, you know, if you are going to have a carbon price, uh, having one that is life cycle based is an interesting approach, right? So really incorporating some of the embedded emissions, but or you know, if we can think about it on a per mile basis. Um, so, you know, I think that can certainly help industry wide to make those decisions being made actively. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody in the back who's been waving their hand or something. Uh, yeah. What do you see as the future of graphite in batteries? Uh, can, can, can you explain a bit more? Do you see graphite continuing to be used in batteries or not? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's one of the miracles that make lithium ion battery work. Uh, um, they are like, uh, some other chemistry, um, like silicon, lithium metal, but I think, um, yeah, my prediction is that uh, for the foreseeable future, probably five, 10 years, you will need graphite for sure. That's right, I forgot. One of the companies I mentioned actually worked on silicon anode, not lithium anode. Um, yeah, I was recently at Sela Nanotechnologies, which makes a silicon anode, and uh, the view was basically that there's infinite market opportunity there because the amount of time it takes to scale to make enough silicon anode to take to displace fully displace graphite, the battery industry is growing so fast you can't even catch up. So um, there's gonna be a lot of graphite for a long time, even when it's not as effective as silicon. I would add some subtlety there, which is to say that um, graphite is one particular form of carbon. And it is known in that form of carbon to intercalate um, a lithium well. I am not familiar with what the current state of the research is on, for instance, graphene, um, which is single layer graphite. Um, graphene is obviously very hard to make uh, in very large amounts, in very small amounts. You can actually just like, you know, take a piece of tape and peel a layer of it yeah, off. We're talking megaton quantities. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of tape. I think the high we're wrong graphene is kind of. Uh, died on a little bit, but uh, well, I am a physicist, you can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can probably add it again. The, the name, as you just described, graphene is single layer, and by nature, it's very difficult to make like tons of single layer stuff. Um, we are talking about atomic single layer, so um, most of the um, um, like graphene batteries out there, I would say they are not actually graphene. <laughs> They're just like smaller graphite. Uh, <laughs> like multi-layer You can't take graphite. that to a venture capitalist though and say we're making smaller graphite batteries. <laughs> we're making multi-layer yeah, multi exactly. graphene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> multi-layer graphene is not graphene. <laughs> oh, um, I'm at, I'll, I'll call on you next week, Kennedy. Uh, yeah. Um, since uh, cattle has been brought up a couple of times, I was curious what you guys think about um, the kind of future of batteries in the context of growing U.S.-China rivalry, knowing that cattle, the largest battery producer in the world, is a Chinese company, BYD, also one of the larger ones, also a Chinese company, and LFP battery technology, I think, is pretty dominant in China, whereas NMC and others are 
more used in the rest of the world. So I'm kind of curious, especially in the context of some of the comments that you guys have made about transitioning towards LPs, how this may or may not uh, reflect some things. I'm going to have to get you on the next panel. Um, I'm going to toss it out to the panelists. I think if I'm right, more than 70% of lithium ion batteries are made by Chinese companies. So this is a very, very impressive uh, amount of capability. And the question I think for, um, for the US and Europe is what does, what, in a multinational company, what does ownership really mean? And if the factory is in Michigan, does it matter if it's a Chinese company or not? And I'm not the one to answer that. And my understanding for IRA at least is that it, it's really about where it is, right? Like where the materials are made, where they come from, where the percent of the value of the, of the battery comes from. So even if it is BYD or cattle, if they're doing it here, it, it at least you know satisfies the, the requirements for the tax credits. Um, yeah, I mean, the, beyond that, in terms of customer perception and all that, that's anyone's guess. Uh, yeah, these companies are starting to launch in not only the batteries, but BYD is launching products in Europe. That will be an interesting test case to see how, how that plays out. Um, but yeah, remains to be seen, but great question. Yeah, <clears throat> my, my tag is that if, if we really want to um, meet the target of um, um, uh, producing EV, only EV by 2035, we, we kind of have to uh, be a little bit more pragmatic, like how to get that. And, of course, there are politics and all that stuff that we can debate about, but I think um, also if you look at the reality, like Ford made an announcement um, uh, with uh, CATL. Actually, there's another company, um, uh, Goshen, they are already uh, building the factories in Michigan, and I think they, they received a um, couple hundred million dollar uh, funding as well. And um, BYD already have a factory uh, in Lancaster building most of the electric buses and actually uh, I think all the electric buses at Sanford are all built by uh, BYD and I think they are probably looking to um, uh, setting up factories here as well uh, for, for uh, potentially uh, battery manufacturing. So I think um, um, it's a very pragmatic way to partner up with um, uh, some of these uh, existing players to set up uh, factories and once the facility is going, then the know-how and the knowledge and the people here know how to do that and, 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 and can spread out. And um, yeah, so I think it's actually um, um, beneficial to, to, to the industry and, and, and to the country. Yeah, I will, I'll add in, I think, I don't know much about global politics. Um, but uh, I think that if you look at um, the EV battery market specifically, um, it's really a very small number of very large companies that are capable of building those cells. Right now, it's essentially Panasonic, um, uh, CATL, and LG. And um, it's very difficult to make very large cells because if you have to scrap them, they're extremely expensive. And they are very difficult to make in general. There's tons of ways to screw up a, um, a cell. And as a result, um, this is one of the reasons, for instance, Tesla has gone to using much smaller cells. Um, and, uh, but you, know, you get better, uh, better gravimetric energy density from using larger cells because it's less packaging and more cell. But um, fundamentally, I think what we're going to start seeing as the prices go up and the, and the demand goes up, you're really gonna see a lot more players get into the EV cell space. Um, I think, uh, for instance, all of these companies that are partnering with Cal, Panasonic, LG to build EVs, uh, EV batteries, do, are, are doing that partnership in order to vertically integrate their supply chain instead of just buying them from China. There's the French shoring aspect as well. And what that is gonna do is really gonna spread around the manufacturing knowledge that's required to make those cells. And that is what's really in short supply. If they're difficult to make. It requires a lot of like, turn that knob. And um, I'm very interested in trying to figure out how we democratize that information using, you know, for instance, uh, Bayesian models and models that can sort of learn from human beings, uh, subject matter experts about how to um, navigate, you know, what you might think of as a very complex landscape of, um, um, of sort of like uh, the, the optimality landscape of a, of, a, of a manufacturing process with like, you know, thousands of variables. 
as we make progress on that, um, it is going to really um, spread the, the, the manufacturing base around. And I think it is going to, to some extent, cut into China's dominance. It could, depending on how heavily the Chinese government decides to um, subsidize that industry and, and push it forward. And that I actually don't know anything about. That's what I'm going to put a cap on that and say I don't know anything about what their, poli what their industrial policy with respect to batteries is. But I suspect it is similar to, actually, I'm not going to put anything. I'm going to put a cap on it. <laughs> Uh, did, you, did you want to ask okay. so, so one in the back? Yeah. Um, I had a question kind of relating to the cobalt question that was asked right now, um, and kind of related to just sustainable batteries in general. Uh, what are people doing or companies doing now to make either the mining or recycling of you know the rare uh, or like the raw materials and things more sustainable? One thing I've seen just emerging is a carbon passport. I think it's called a passport associated with materials where you're going to track the life cycle emissions from, from the very point that it's extracted through processing until the final product. And so that's really exciting because that means that people can choose to pay a premium or companies can choose to premium source things that have lower environmental impact. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how that supply chain traces through. Will, that will actually bring advantages to cobalt because we're finding deep, high quality resources that, that are very dense in, um, it, like, instead of, a, instead of a low concentration resource at the surface, it takes a lot of energy to extract. You're finding a very concentrated resource that is inherently uh, takes less energy to extract. So um, we'd be excited to have that spread. Yeah, on, on the recycling side, I think, um, uh, it's actually the market force that is playing because um, actually nobody throw EV batteries uh, to landfill because people are buying it like it, it worth money and uh, even for like a dead dead uh, EV battery packs you can sell it for like a couple hundred dollars um, and if you have some capacity remaining um, and it 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 it, uh, it was a couple thousand dollars uh, each so. Um, in terms of EV, I don't think there's a big issue with like people dumping packs into landfill. I would say um, most of the lithium ion batteries in the landfill probably coming is from consumer electronics, like uh, your mobile phone, your toys, and, and other stuff. So I think it, the market force is playing like in, in, in favorably uh, in terms of sustainability for EV battery recycling. I think we'll take uh, one more question. Uh, we had one somewhere. Yeah. And it's very related to sustainability, and you have covered both emissions and also, I guess, the equity part of things when it comes to sustainability. But when, as we scale up, I'm very curious if there are known environmental impacts in mining larger amounts uh, of these materials. Yeah, you have to look out for the water source because many of these places are deserts and so you have to make sure that you're sourcing your water um, sustainably as well um, the uh, there's always challenges with uh, extracting material any sort of material that you want to use um, but I don't know how we will make 1.3 billion EVs without um, without some small impacts um, great well, um, we're going to have this um, uh, space for a little while longer. We can sit, we can talk, we can discuss, and we can have uh, a great time. I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Um, I really appreciate you being here. Please sign up on our mailing list. Please uh, sign up to hear me rant on Fridays about um, climate tech topics. And um, I want to ask, um, I know I made the pitch before for support from all of you. Um, I want to say specifically um, for all my friends uh, who may be here on behalf of uh, any, any organization that has the word venture in or capital or uh, anything in its name, if you learned something here tonight, if you found this to be informative and to help you understand how to better invest your dollars to make impact, please talk to me about it so that we can keep doing that and we can engage with you about how to continue to support these events because they do not come for free even though you did.
Um, <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. This is a really great event. I'm always really excited. It's the best part of my week or month to come out and see all you people here interested in topics that I find uh, it difficult to understand anybody without a PhD would find interesting at all. So this is super awesome seeing you all out here. Thank you very much. And thank you to our panelists, of course. Uh, double thanks to Madur, who double, uh, double, did double duty as panelist and shadow moderator. And uh, thank you to uh, Sarah, uh, who uh, remembered to turn on the camera and uh, who organized everything. Come out next month for methane and uh, stay on the mailing list if you have interest in hearing about equitable transition to vehicles. And if you have a particular topic you're interested in hearing about, you know, companies that want to come talk or you just want to find out about something, please come and talk to me and we will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.